Good afternoon and welcome to this, the final campus conversation of the academic year. I'm Dan Mogala from the university's Office of Communications and Public Affairs. And I'm thrilled and honored to welcome today for this uh, year end wrap up Chancellor Carol Christ and our interim executive vice chancellor and provost Kathy Koshlin. Good morning or good afternoon to both of you. Good afternoon. So uh, let's just start in the usual way. We'd just love to hear from each of you. Um, Carol, perhaps if you could go first, just some thoughts on the year that's wrapping up and some thoughts about the road ahead. Well, I first want to say thank you to everyone uh, listening in today. This has been an extraordinarily hard year. Um, it, it, following a hard year before that, I think that as a as campus, as a as a city, as a state, as a nation, as a world, we've been through a community trauma. And I, even as we continue to deal with the medical impacts, the health impacts of the virus, I think it's really important to also acknowledge how um, difficult the impacts have been on um, and on all the communities that we inhabit. And to say thank you to all of you for your resilience in hard times, hard times, not just in terms of the institutional life of the university, but hard times in terms of, I'm sure, many of your personal lives. So I want to thank you for that. I also want to say right at the beginning um, to thank Kathy Koshlin for her leadership. She stepped in as our interim uh, uh, executive vice chancellor and provost at a particularly challenging moment when Paul Alavisados went off to be the president of the University of Chicago. And she's done such a spectacular job leading us through really, really challenging uh, circumstances. Um, and I, I can't thank her enough and want to thank her publicly in this forum as we begin this conversation. Um, super. And Kathy, before I turn to you, I've uh, neglected to mention that we would love to take your questions for all who are watching and with us today. All you need to do is post them to UC Berkeley's Facebook page on the Facebook Live site. Um, and we will do our best to get to all of your questions. And Kathy, with that beautiful setup that the Chancellor just provided, a few thoughts on the year, on your time in office and the road ahead? Well, first I wanna say thank you to Carol for asking me to take this on. Um, it has been really a joy to serve this campus, this community for this year in this way. And I, I can't think of a better way to um, finish my active faculty career than, than in this, with this responsibility. Um, I'm looking forward to being an emerita, um, and so that's the road ahead, um, but I plan to be an active emerita, so I, I will be around. Um, but I also want to say thank you, as Carol did, to echo her thanks to this community for all the work that has gone on, all of the efforts made, whether it's by our students, our student leaders, our staff, um, who have just stepped forward in so many ways under often very difficult personal circumstances, um, their resilience has come back. And our faculty who have adapted first to being oh, online a year ago, now to being um, back mostly in person, but having to pivot and respond as, as they or their families or their students um, get ill. Um, fortunately, while this latest version seems to be quite contagious, um, at least um, it seems to be um, more manageable than, than prior, prior versions. So we're, we're all rolling with it at the moment. Um, but again, I just, I wanna say thank you to this community for um, their support of, of me throughout this year and their um, efforts as, as Carol and I have navigated um, the challenges that have been, have presented themselves to us um, even recently. Yeah. So I want to drill down with both of you a little bit on the workplace issues. We have, um, as far as we can tell, largely a staff audience for these campus conversation events. So Carol, let me ask you a little bit more about what you're hearing and what advice you have um, for how people can sort of take care of themselves and take care of their colleagues and take care of the people who report to them. I have really two pieces of advice. First, let me preface this by saying, I still think we're figuring out what the post-pandemic 
workplace looks like. And we've discovered that some work, but not all work, can be done effectively um, remotely. And what that balance is going to be for particular individuals and particular jobs, we're still working out. I mean, because we are fundamentally an in-person institution that we teach students in person, that we interact with our colleagues, um, we interact with our students in person, that, that I think one of the things the pandemic has taught us is how important face-to-face -face learning is for the very business of the university. That said, we probably can have much more elasticity of place in the workplace that will enable all of us to, um, to, 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 better, um, to better balance our, our, our lives. I wanna say two things in regard to your question, Dan, that seem as if they're, they're, there's a slight tension between them. I at first think it's so important for everyone to take the time that you need for rest, for relaxation, for the pursuits outside of work that you love, for friends, for family. Um, I used to joke a lot that we have come to live in a 7-Eleven world in which people expect us to be available 7 to 11 all the time. And I think it's important to um, put boundaries around your work so that you can lead the full life that we all desire. That said, I think it's also important to make the commitment to be in community. There is, as I said in my introductory remarks, there are lots of ways the community has suffered uh, during the pandemic, all the communities that we're parts of. And we're going to have to be quite purposeful in the rebuilding of community. And that means being there when other people are there. Uh, that it is, at least in my experience, hard to rebuild a community um, remotely. And, um, and so personal presence is gonna be important, not only for some of the activities that are the very core of our mission, but it's important for rebuilding the community that we all value. Kathy, let me sort of pose the same question. Maybe if you could talk in particular about what you're hearing from, from faculty, from the academic as opposed to the administrative side of the house as well. That's a good question, um, Dan, because I think faculty actually have always enjoyed um, a great flexibility in their, in their work lives. They can spend the morning in their home office and come into campus to teach and, and go to their labs or some faculty who are in their labs six days a week. I mean, there's an enormous range of flexibility that faculty have. I think where they run into challenges are, two, are twofold. One, how do they ensure that they have the, the community? So things like PhD seminars or other weekly events that bring everyone to campus become important for those academic communities. But then there's also the need to really make sure that students, whether it's undergraduates or graduate students, really have a sense of a they're there, that they don't walk into um, you know, a department um, suite and find you know, no one present. Um, and, and that's finding that right balance of what, when do, you, when do you bring everyone together, usually on a weekly basis and what that looks like, how you support staff who may be there five days a week, um, because they're interacting with students, they're advising, they're, they're running the office, um, they need that contact with faculty. So again, to Carol's point, I think we're all trying to work out what the right <clears throat> cadence is, what the right um, number of days to be present. Um, some of our units have experimented with three days a week here, two days a week remote for those folks who, who can do that. Um, but again, we're all experimenting and all, all working on this. And, and it, it really does vary across the campus, depending on what role you have, what responsibilities you have as to whether you're here five days a week or <clears throat> three days a week, or you're 100% remote. Yeah. 
Um, as long as we're on the business of the university, let's stay there for a little bit. Um, Carol, I want to ask you about what our financial health is, it looks like. I know there was a lot of concern last year and in, in, into this year, and it seems that some good things have happened with the state budget. But I think it remains a little unclear to a lot of people about exactly what our status is right now in terms of financial health. Well, things are definitely getting better. The state budget, though this is right now, the season in which the state budget is being negotiated, so we don't know what it's going to be. But many of the signs are good. The, uh, the governor has proposed a 5% increase to the campus's um, state allocation. He's actually proposed that for the next five years. That's very good news, particularly in this inflationary climate that, that we're living in. And uh, the state has a big surplus. It's very much my hope that some of that will get uh, allocated to the University of California for capital needs, which we, we, we very much need. Um, and the state is also committed to uh, uh, funding the additional enrollment that it would like to see us take on. So, um, so the, 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 the news on the state front is good. Uh, th that said, we're still in a challenging fiscal situation. Um, the fact of the matter is that the money that we get from the state does not adequately fund the cost of the education that we offer. And so we have to multiply and diversify our funding sources to make up that, to make up that difference. Uh, in addition, the pandemic has put a lot of stress on it and we've tried to buffer the impact of the pandemic on units by using our central reserves, but our now the, like Mother Hubbard, our cupboard is bare, our central reserves don't exist anymore and we have to replenish them. It's not a healthy place to be. So um, Rosemary Ray and Kathy and the incoming EVCP, Ben Hermelin, uh, we're all strategizing in how to rebuild those central reserves and how to multiply and diversify revenue sources in a way that will give us a stronger financial model moving forward. But the financial news is much better um, this year than certainly it's been in the last two years. And we're also moving toward a cohort tuition model in which uh, we will begin to see regular increases in tuition, which of course will, will go to the bottom line and give us more income. I wanna follow up on a couple of things you mentioned, but before I do, I just wanna remind people who may have joined us late that um, we're here in the last campus conversation of the year with Chancellor Christ and Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost Kathy Koshlin. And we would love to take your questions. If you have any, they can be posted to UC Berkeley's Facebook, Facebook page. Um, but Carol, let me circle back on something. First, you know, something you said reminded me I, there was an otherwise, actually, it was an excellent piece in Berkeley side about the history, the university's history, insofar as student housing is concerned. And, you know, I noticed that the, the comments, at least the most of the negative comments that came were based on what I, I'm not sure is true. And that's this idea that we benefit from enrolling additional students and that therefore, because of our financial interest, we've been over enrolling to generate revenue and because we're really just a big business. Is there any truth in that? I, no, that's really a mistaken and oversimplified view of what happens. Um, first of all, I should say, you know, bottom line, we're in the enrollment business, but the amount of money that we get from the combination of the state allocation for, um, uh, uh, per, per student and the tuition that in-state students pay does not cover the cost of education. There's a deficit of about $15,000 per student and that wow. has to be made up um, by other sources of funding. It's one of the reasons that out-of-state students are so important to our financial model. They subsidize the cost of education for in-state students. So though it is true that we get additional money <clears throat> for every student that we enroll, that money that the state gives us per student when combined with the cost 
of the um, of the, the or the the tuition that the student pays does not cover uh, the cost of of education. The pressure to increase enrollment is not coming from the campus; it's coming from the state. One of the pieces of uh, it's it's good news, but there's kind of dark lining in this good news. We had almost one hundred and fifty thousand applications for places in Berkeley's freshman and transfer classes this year. That means that the demand is enormous. As one member of the legislature told me, um, I'm afraid to go to the supermarket after you send out your letters because um, so many people are disappointed with their brilliant son, daughter, grandson, granddaughter, nephew, niece, not getting into Berkeley. Um, we deny so many um, really, really able, worthy students. And so um, the, the pressure to increase enrollment is coming from um, student demand for Berkeley and from the legislature, not from um, our desire to make money. Um, I'm going to come back to you in a second, but I want to because um, I want to talk about the capital budget. Before I do, just something you said reminded me. I wanted to ask Kathy about faculty hires. We've been talking about the workplace and talking about um, budget and things like that. How has that impacted our faculty hires? Are we hiring more faculty? What's going on on that front, Kathy? The, the good news is that we are um, uh, actively hiring faculty. Uh, the pressure for retaining faculty is maybe amped up a little bit from some of our most competitive um, peers, but we do very well at retaining them. And we will, we are in the middle of deciding how many faculty searches we will authorize for next year, but it will be around 70. And that's a healthy number for um, accommodating retirements or departures. Um, so we're excited about that possibility, working closely with the Academic Senate on, on finalizing that number and, and deciding where those, those allocations um, are going. But we've had a very healthy, uh, in reviewing the cases, there's just some spectacular new faculty joining us. Um, we met some of them last night at a reception, just, uh, just amazing group of, of folks who have joined us in the last two years. And we're excited about the ones that we're seeing. And as I'm looking at cases of faculty being promoted, they're just amazing colleagues doing, doing work that is so essential for our communities, um, whether it's in the social sciences, the arts, the sciences, engineering, business law, um, incredible. So I'm, I'm excited. I, 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 this is one of the best possible places to be in terms of your, your intellectual colleagues. And, and um, as Carol has often said, history is made here every day. And that, that is just so true when you, when you talk to them and read their files and, and understand um, where they're taking their work, their students. So I think we're in a good place. Very good. The fabulous news. And I want to now, Carol, circle back and, and pick up a little bit about the, you, you mentioned the capital budget. Um, maybe just explain a little bit what that is and why that's a particular concern or a particular priority at the moment. Now, when we talk about budgets, we talk about the operating budget, which is what pays people's salaries, what, um, what really runs the university. The capital budget is the budget for construction whether that's deferred maintenance or renovation of buildings or um, constructing new buildings. And Rosemary Ray has frequently said to me, I'm, <coughs> excuse me, absolutely confident that I can solve the operating budget problem of the campus. I cannot solve the capital budget problem. We used to have bond issues about every two years that were our main source of general obligation bonds passed by the voters that were our main source of funding for uh, capital construction. We haven't had a bond issue since 2006, so that we're increasingly reliant on long-term debt and on philanthropy and have um, 
much, much um, lower amounts of state funding for capital uh, construction. This is a huge problem for the Berkeley campus because we have a, um, the seismic reinforcement of our buildings alone is about $5.4 billion in seismic work wow. that we have to do. In addition, so many of our laboratories are in poor shape, um, hard to do cutting edge science in those laboratories. Uh, um, uh, uh, Doug Clark, who's the Dean of the College of Chemistry, has taken me on the Dr. Frankenstein's laboratory tour <laughs> of the chemistry building. I mean, it's just, we, we, we really need capital dollars and it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's the most serious um, structural problem that we're facing in regard to our budget. Wow. Um you know, speaking of infrastructure, Kathy, perhaps this is a good point to give us a little update about the Moffett Field project. I think there's still a number of people who are unfamiliar with what its possible contours are, a little introduction, and maybe also just address how can we be pursuing something like that while at the same time facing these challenges closer to home in terms of capital and infrastructure um, financing. That's a, that's a great question, um, Dan. So Moffett Field, which is down near um, uh, Mountain View on the peninsula, um, is a NASA um, facility that we have partnered with, with private developers to um, develop a site that's I think about 38 acres um, for collaborative research in um, aerospace, space science, um, transportation via the air, um, any number of possibly things like astrobiology, a whole range of intellectual um, endeavors um, where we can partner with, with NASA, um, but also take advantage of a location that is surrounded by many of the high-tech companies with whom we already have some active collaborations. And so the possibilities for um, not just research, but um, graduate experiences, um, internships for um, undergraduates, uh, opportunities to work with companies create startups and incubators on that site. Um, it'll take about four or five years to get the facilities um, built. In the meantime, we're working on what the academic program is, uh, working out all the details of the um, financing for that site. Um, but it, it's, it's a very different project than say, needing to build a new building, a, a chemistry building on the campus. It's, it's, it's fundamentally different. And it's, it's a it's an opportunity that Rose has been particularly engaged in and, and Carol um, working, as I said, with, with our, our, our private partners and with the, the academic leadership um, that's associated with the project. So it offers us, this is another place where potentially when we talk about enrollment growth and enrollment pressures, if we were to say in the long run have a thousand students at Moffitt, well, that's a thousand students that more that we could have on the on the core campus. So we're looking at opportunities where it makes sense for us to think about satellite locations, not just for research, but also potentially for um, education. So I just to be clear, I'm I'm assuming that the involvement of private partners in this sort of collaborative um, approach that we're taking sort of obviates the need for a, gr a great deal of investment of the campus's own resources. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, fantastic. And when do you think we're going to have a better idea? Of, I know we're sort of still in the exploratory phase, but what are we looking at the timeline? Tim, we'll have a good sense of, yes, this is a happening thing and we're really proceeding with it. Well, as I said, I, we're, we're working out certain details at the moment. And then when the actual construction and everything, it'll take four or five years to, uh -huh. to realize the vision. I think that's, uh, Carol, do you have any? Yeah, I, I think in 10 years, this is a long-term project. <laughs> Got it. Um, Carol, I want to circle back to something you mentioned that was philanthropy. We're in the middle of a campaign. How's it going? It's going spectacularly. When the pandemic started, um, I, when we went remote just two weeks after the, um, the, the uh, uh, kickoff of, of the public phase of our campaign, I thought philanthropy was going to really decline. Instead, it's increased and people have been extraordinarily generous. We, um, our goal 
which when we decided on this goal was a stretch goal is $6 billion. We have just crossed the $5.5 billion mark wow. much earlier than we thought we would. We think we're going to um, hit our goal a year ahead of time. Uh, and so I'm really so grateful to all the, the many, many donors who have been so generous to Berkeley, just giving extraordinary gifts that, um, that uh, enrich our programs in, in multiple ways. How do you understand that performance? How do you understand the extent to which the campaign exceeded all expectations? Yes, I, I know the stock market was very healthy and um, I know for you know, a certain socioeconomic level, the recent years have been very productive and lucrative, but is there something else afoot here in terms of people's connection and thought to and thoughts about the university, Carol? Um, well, I think there are three factors. Um, one is, as you, you mentioned, there's been an enormous uh, creation of wealth during the pandemic um, um, because the stock market, particularly tech stocks, but also startups have, have, have really been making so much money. Uh, so people have, have wealth. Um, and the pandemic has also made people so much more conscious of the enormous uh, income inequality and wealth inequality in the United States. I think that that has motivated giving. We've see, particularly seen giving to um, uh, um, financial aid, to emergency um, financial aid for, for students, for a diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging projects. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think there's a third factor, which is I think the pandemic has made us all aware of our mortality and that it's motivated people who um, uh, really want to um, make a legacy gift to make that gift at, at this point in time. So I think it's those factors all coming together that is motivated this extraordinary generosity on the part of our uh, alumni and friends. Wow, so interesting. Who would have thought um, really kind of defied, I think everyone's expectations, as you mentioned. Um, I'm gonna stay on the good news front, Kathy, just a little bit. Um, in terms of our division of computing data science and society, uh, my understanding is we're, we're on the verge of morphing that into a new college. Where are we? What's going on? And I know when we talked before, as we were preparing for this event, you were just so excited about it. Share a little bit about a little bit of news and about why this is such a great development in your opinion. Well, thanks, Dan. I think this is a really exciting time. This is something that has been actually in um, uh, incubating um, for almost a decade. Um, uh, sometimes I feel like we've gone a little bit too slowly, but I'm really excited that the um, proposal is currently um, being reviewed. There's a, the formal proposal um, uh, is being reviewed by our academic Senate. They will conclude that review, I believe this spring. It will then move to um, system-wide for their review and ultimately um, we'll, we'll, we are hoping for approval um, by next summer so that we will actually be able to begin to implement the college in the in the fall of of 23 it might fall into 24 just to you know there's certain things that are out of our control like the review by the system-wide senate that could take longer or office of the president but we're well on our way um what's exciting is the number of um programs so that college will have the the data science program um, we have a, a really unique situation that I'm excited about, which is a department that is shared between two colleges. So the, the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science is fully shared between, will, will be fully shared between the new college, currently it's shared by the division, but by the new college and the College of Engineering. And that provides links into the society so side of the CDSS name, the College of Data Science, of Computing Data Science and Society. And that linkage is really critical because data science is um, pervasive across all academic disciplines today. Um, whether it's the arts, um, uh, language, linguistics, social science, as well as the hard sciences, data science is present. The tools that are being developed are being used across all disciplines. It's, it's a, a core um, uh, 
set of ideas and and resources that um, really every student should have access to. And one of my hopes is that um, even if we have to begin to limit to some degree the numbers of students majoring in data science or computer science, every student ought to have access to data eight, which is the introduction to data science, because it is really how to be literate in the 21st century. Um, and, and a knowledge of data science is going to be important for everything that we do. So it, I think it's a, a really important step for the campus and, and for the you know, intellectual community as a whole. I see it as additive and not detractive. Um, I think it will provide, we're, we're, we're doing some amazing things. The other thing that's associated with this college is a program that is a joint um, graduate group between UCSF and Berkeley with four faculty, three of whom have said yes to us, four new faculty will be joining us in computational precision health. And that new department or new program is again, shared equally between UCSF and Berkeley. Um, it has dynamite leaders um, uh, from both campuses, and we're really excited what these new young faculty will bring to the conversation about health and, um, and data going forward. So before I ask Carol a broader question about our relationship with UCSF, I have a pop quiz for you, Kathy. <laughs> what is computational precision health? <laughs> That's a really good question, but it really means bringing um, the combined data that we have. So if you take like Kaiser has this amazing database of all kinds of information about patients and you can, you know, you can anonymize that data and then begin to mine it for patterns of mm. all kinds of things. So being able to then take a, an individual's circumstances and place it in a context where you can identify both appropriate therapies, directions, what risk factors there may be. It just gives you a much more power as a clinician to be able to serve an individual patient. It also gives power to the public health community who looks at population health and begin to see patterns and discern things that are going on. Something that epidemiologists and biostatisticians have been doing forever, but this there, there are more powerful tools and algorithms that you can begin to use to really interrogate the information. And then there's sub factors when you look at information around um, you know, genetics and being, under, being under, what's the relationship between a particular genetic profile and a disease profile? Um, and when is something um, predictive of risk? Um, it's always just predictive of risk. It's not a guarantee that you will end up getting that illness or whatever, but it, you know, again, those kinds of information become really powerful tools in, in being able to, um, you know, create a healthy individual and healthy communities. No surprise, you nailed the pop quiz. Okay, just checking. <laughs> um, Carol, talk to us a little bit about, uh, on a broader level, what's happening in that relationship between UC Berkeley and UCSF. It, it seems like it really has substantively changed in recent years. Well, I think both UCSF and Berkeley have realized that the other campus has something that they very much need. Um, uh, for, um, from uh, Berkeley's point of view, many of our faculty want to be closer to a medical school hmm. and want to have access to uh, doing clinical trials on um, work with medical um, applications that, that they're doing. We're relatively unusual in being a major research university without a medical school. From UCSF's point of view, one of the things that's developed in, um, in, the, um, in the discovery of medical treatments is how increasingly dependent they are on fields like engineering, or as oh. Kathy was just explaining, data science, things that UCSF is never going to develop on its own. So uh, we've been trying to deepen the partnership with UCSF because each of us has something that is of enormous service to the others. And they're, they're really great partners. We used to, of course, be one university. And then we were, um, when the different campuses of the university came into being, in the 1960s that we were separated from each other, but we're, we're, we're um, seeking one of the things that um, I think about a lot are transformational partnerships. We have a transformational partnership with Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory on the Hill. It's so um, profoundly 
interrelated to so many of the things with so many of the things that are happening on campus. It's my hope that Moffett Field is going to be a transformational partnership with NASA Ames. Similarly, I hope that UCSF will become a transformational partnership for the campus. Um, Kathy, I'm gonna, I, since we're talking about research, I wanna come to you in just a second and ask about how we're doing on that front in the aggregate and just in terms of faculty successes in, in, in our research enterprise. But before I do that, just want to remind everyone that um, we'd be happy to take your questions. If you do have questions for the chancellor or the provost, they can be posted to UC Berkeley's Facebook page. But so, Kathy, let me let me follow up on that. Um, how are we doing in terms of research funding as a campus and what's what stood out for you in the last year in terms of particular faculty success stories? I think, first of all, it's it's amazing that we are doing about a billion dollars a year in research in terms of, of bringing in research grants and our faculty are continuing to be um, incredibly competitive, both in the individual efforts, but also in, in garnering large um, grants that are, you know, multi-million dollar and multi-year um, grants. It's an area that continues to be um, a bit of a challenge. I, I think we are working hard to shore up our infrastructure to support our faculty in, in their ability to, to get grants, particularly those large institutional grants that often involve many PIs, you know, principal investigators will involve um, often more than one institution. And so making it possible for our faculty to obtain those grants um, more easily is, is, is important. And what's exciting is it's a full range. You know, we, we tend to focus on the, some of the big um, grants that come into departments like electrical engineering and computer science or, or molecular and cell biology, but we've gotten some remarkable grants into African-American studies, um, uh, as well as um, some other social science grants that are, are impressive. So I, I, I think it's important to remember that we are a comprehensive university and we have amazing faculty doing amazing research um, in, in all areas of, of the institution. And um, you know, writing, writing books, um, publishing articles, um, running trials, doing all kinds of things. And one other exciting area that is really um, developing and <clears throat> we're actually in some ways taking a leadership position on is, is uh, community engaged scholarship where faculty are, are out in the community working with community partners where the partners are helping to co-create the nature of the research. And over the years, there's been um, some remarkable efforts um, in that area. <clears throat> One of my colleagues, Brenda Eskenazi, um, ran the Chamacos Project in the Salinas Valley, which is an amazing project, again, that engaged the community. <clears throat> Excuse me, we have other kinds of things like that that are happening. Um, another colleague is sort of leading an effort system-wide to help define what that means for our faculty and the kind of norms and expectations we should have when we are out engaging with the community um, and, and ways in which they're able to be involved and benefit from the research. Um, so it, it, a really important shift that I think Berkeley has been a leader in and had faculty um, leading in for quite a while. That's fantastic. Carol, anything, just wondering anything you wanted to add to that or embellish? I, 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 one of, for me, one of the thrilling things that's happened this year is to see the growth of the Wild Neuro Hub. Uh, that is a wonderful gift that went jointly, talking about the UCSF Berkeley partnership, jointly to Berkeley UCSF and the University of Washington to study the, um, uh, the, the, the biological bases of uh, neurodegenerative diseases and um, therapeutic interventions that might, um, that might uh, help um, lessen their, 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 their impacts. And, um, and that, that the research has just been thrilling. There's so many things that are going on in this campus that are really so, it's, it's as um, Kathy was saying before, and making history every day. So speaking of so many things going on in this campus, it's it, it's almost it takes me aback that this that this is an issue that I wanted to ask you about, and people suggested, and it has to do with the electric microgrid, which reminds me we're not just a comprehensive university; we're like a, a city. So what 
what is it? What is the electric microgrid and what are we talking about and why do we care about that? Well, it, the, the electro microgrid is, um, is the way in which we're going to achieve a total electrification of the campus. Mm. Currently, we have a cogeneration plant that is on its last legs. It only has about 10 years of life. And it's a combination of, um, it uses uh, 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 both natural gas and electricity. We want to move away from natural gas, which is the environmentally responsible thing to do, and move to complete electrification. And we're going to do this by having our own electric microgrid um, uh, on campus. Uh, it, the center of the grid is going to be uh, underneath North Field. That's the field that's right between the music library and um, the Hearst Gym. And, um, but it will have nodes all over campus. And we're, we're very, we're advocating very strongly and hope we will um, uh, get state funding to do the first stage of construction on this microgrid. Let's stick with the construction theme a little bit more. I know we're bouncing all over the place, but it's just a sign of how many pots we have our fingers in at UC Berkeley. And that's about housing. Carol, can you give us a little update about where things stand with housing in general, student housing, and People's Park, and the Anchor House project in particular? I'm delighted. First of all, we opened one um, housing project, which was built for us and then gifted to us. It's called the Intersection. It's in Emeryville. It's graduate student apartments. So that um, apartment house is now operating. Anybody that drives down Oxford Street can see a great big hole um, on between uh, Oxford and Shattuck and University Avenue and Berkeley Way. That's going to be the site of Anchor House. Uh, it's a residence hall for transfer students. It's going to be spectacular when it's finished. And that, um, that uh, uh, residence hall is um, going to be built for us and then gifted to us by the donors. And, um, and uh, it'll be the biggest gift ever in Berkeley's history, um, now about $300 million. And not only that, this gift will keep on giving because the money we save by virtue of the fact that we won't have debt service on this building, that it will be a gift is um, stipulated by terms of the gift to be used for uh, st scholarships for our neediest students. So that's so exciting. And then two more housing projects that are in process. One is People's Park, uh, where we hope to begin construction at some point this summer. Um, a, a key to um, People's Park is it's, a, it's really a four point project. Um, it has the, um, the residence hall, which will be apartments for upperclassmen, upperclass students. Uh, there will be about 125 apartments, about 185 beds that'll be permanent supportive housing for the homeless. Um, that supportive means that there'll be services that, um, that uh, will be formerly unhoused people um, use and need in the building itself. And then about 60% will be a park. Um, so the three parts are the park, the residence hall, and the um, uh, support of permanent supportive housing for the homeless. The fourth part is um, that we will offer housing to anyone currently camping in the park. Um, we have reached an agreement with the Roadway Inn, that's a motel on University Avenue, jointly with the city and we will be offering housing at the Roadway Inn starting I think fairly soon to unhoused individuals in the park. So our commitment is to offer housing to everyone in the park. Um, I think many people probably know that since I've begun as chancellor, uh, we have a social worker that's on our payroll who works with the unhoused population in People's Park and also um, around the campus. And that person, Ari Mulight, has um, offered housing, has successfully housed about 100 people in wow. the years that he's been working for us. And we intend to continue that commitment. <coughs> you know, one, one other thing, and Kathy, I, we have a couple of interesting questions that have come in from folks who are watching about CDSS that I'm going to come back to you. But before I do, um, 
Carol, one of the things that a lot of people who've lived in Berkeley for a long time have noted, and in particular after the joint press conference you held in March with the mayor um, about this partnership to help provide transitional housing and supportive service, services to the unhoused people currently in People's Park was the nature of the town gown relationship. Um, it really seems to have changed and solidified in some pretty amazing ways or not. How do you see it from where you sit? Well, I see a good town gown relationship is absolutely essential to both the city and to Berkeley. Um, I, I've been a, a resident of the city of Berkeley since I started here as a faculty member in 1970 with the exception of my, my years at Smith College. I love the city of Berkeley. Um, many of our faculty, many of our staff, many of our students live in Berkeley. And the university defines the city. It mm. is its most important um, feature. It gives character to the city. So having a good working relationship with the city is a very important priority um, for me. It's something I've worked hard on and I feel so fortunate in having a great partner in Mayor Aragine and also members of the city council. Uh, Rigel Robinson, for example, one of our council members was an ASUC external vice, uh, uh, um, vice, external affairs vice president when he was a student and then ran for a city council seat. Yeah, so it sounds like it's really on one of the best foundations in many years. I mean, is, would that be an accurate takeaway? Um, I, I, it's certainly on a very good foundation. Got it. Um, Kathy, question for you, a follow-up question from um, staff member, or maybe faculty members watching. They said they had a, uh, this is about the plan for having a separate school for data science. And the question is, why isn't Berkeley planning to have a similar school for computer science? Also, as many of the departments depend on computer science as well, and many other universities created a separate school or are planning to have a separate school of consider, uh, computer science, why not have two that to sort of separate them out, computer and data sciences? That's an interesting question. I think the reality is, is that, that they are very um, intertwined and interdependent. Um, it's one of the reasons that the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science is actually joint between the College of Engineering and, <clears throat> and the anticipated new college, um, because there are, there are faculty who are largely computer scientists, there are faculty who are electrical engineers, and then there's a group of faculty who are really kind of in the middle, bringing those two sides together. And, and then you have faculty who are very engaged in the computer science data science overlap and have contributed. So for example, in the teaching of the, our data science courses, the responsibility for that curriculum has been shared between our department of statistics and faculty in computer science. So it, it's, it's one where, where rather than creating more silos, we're actually trying to create ways in which we have more interdisciplinarity, where, where we share um, those, where those interests are shared and where, where we have, you wanna bring the research together in ways that's synergetic. You want to bring the students experience together in ways that, that allow them to really develop skills both in computer science and data science. And so the, the data science major has certain requirements that are shared with a computer science major, and then there are very different aspects of it as well. So, you know, again, it's it's more um, to not be rigidly separate and distinct, but rather to bring folks together in in creative ways. Got it. Um, we only have a few minutes left, so I want to kind of move towards some wrap up questions. And something that came in from the audience is is perfect in that vein in that context. And I want to pose it to each of you. Um, this person said, first of all, thank you to both of you for your service to the campus and asked, where do you see the campus in the next year? Where do you see the campus in the next five years? Kathy, let me stick with you on that. Where, where do you see us headed in the next year to five years? <laughs> That's a great question, Dan. Um, I'll say there's a couple things. Um, one that we haven't really touched on today um, and one that you know Carol and Ben will be working on is working on our um, financial sustainability and, and thinking about how we actually um, 
have the resources to carry out the work that we want to do. So that's going to be a big lift. It will take a few years. We've made a, a, a beginning to that conversation this year. Didn't get as far as we wanted because of things like the enrollment crisis that happened in February that slowed down our, our work on financial sustainability. It's an area where we've had a great partnership with the Academic Senate. Um, terrific leadership coming there, both from uh, Ron Cohen and Marianne Smart, but also from Holly DeRamus, who's chair of CAPRA. So we've had a very productive beginning, uh, did a lot of information sharing around that. So that's a really key area for us to, to, for us to do all the things that we would like to do. That's an area where we're going to have to really work hard to, to make sure we're, our, our financial um, house is in order. The second thing that I think is really exciting is we've embarked on, on even more conversations around undergraduate education. This is an area that I've spent obviously a lot of time on in my, in my the years as, as a leader. And I'm excited with the work that um, the Discovery Initiative is undertaking leadership from, from Brie Rosenblum. Um, and certainly, the, um, you know, shout out to our interim um, Vice Provost for Undergraduate Education, Oliver O'Reilly, for picking up and, and really moving some things forward this year in that space. Um, there is some really exciting collaboration between uh, the various college deans around the, the undergraduate experience. I think we have a focus on that, that that is stronger than we've ever had. Um, we've also made some, some I think, remarkable um, headway on, uh, for example, having a differentiated um, self-help financial aid issue where we actually have a lower self-help for um, first-year students than for continuing students. And that was something that, that many of our private peers have done for years, partly because your earning power increases as you mature as a, as, a, as a student. So that's an important area because it means less pressure on our first year students to have to earn that many more hours of work to earn money if, because they have a better financial situation. So that, that combined with our efforts in discovery and the opportunity for students to really engage in what it means to be part of a research university, I think is really, really exciting. And then I think the third area that is really important, and again, a conversation that, that Ben and Carol will be leading next year is, what's a right mix for graduate education between academic graduate students, our PhD students, and our professional students? And what, what are important areas for investment that support the state? So investment in educators, investment in, in the School of Social Welfare, um, investment in the School of Public Health. What, what's the right balance and mix of professional education combined with academic education and, and ed educating the next um, generation of the professoriate? Uh, so there's, there's both exciting things happening in that space, but also a need to, to think strategically about where Berkeley can make its biggest impact. Um, in terms of, 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 of those roles. Carol, same question for you. Where do you see the university or, or perhaps where do you hope the university will be five years from now? Well, five years from now, I think it's a term that I've used before in this, um, this, this uh, interview, this conversation. I think we're going to um, see more what I call elasticity of place. I think we're going to have much more of an investment in online opportunities for learning, whether those are completely remote programs or just programs that allow students to take an internship or study abroad while still making progress in on some of their required courses on, on the campus. So I, I think that we are even as next year, we're gonna be returning to the sense of place that so much defines the university in, um, in this society. I think we're going to be creating the resources that allow for more elasticity in place, whether that's satellite campuses or remote learning. The other thing that I think that we're gonna see in the next five years are more and more, and again, it's a term I used before, transformational partnerships, the kinds of problems that our faculty really want to address, things like climate change or uh, the, the, the bases of neurodegenerative disease or uh, CRIS the uses of CRISPR technology in uh, both agriculture and in human health. 
require collaborations across institutions and even across institution types. One of the exciting things that's happened just in the last week has been the opening of the Baker Bioingenuity Hub, um, which is an incubator and accelerator for startups. We're gonna see more it to, to, to address the kinds of big issues that we need to address as a state, as a country, as a planet requires um, what I was calling transformational partnerships, um, both institutional partnerships among universities, but also partnerships with other kinds of institutions mm. in order to address the very big problems that our planet needs to solve. So we only have a few minutes and with all that exciting stuff, Kathy, going on, I can only ask how the heck is it that you're leaving us? <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Dan. Um, you know, it, I'll say a couple of things. One, I've been on campus for 38 years. Um, I know there are colleagues who stay longer, but I also believe strongly that um, there's a time when as a faculty member, it's time to relinquish your faculty place to a new young colleague and give the next generation or two generations down um, a start um, in, in this remarkable place. And the wonderful thing I've gathered from colleagues who have already um, turned, you know, become emerita is they have a really good time and they get to do just what they want to do um, <laughs> and pursue, you know, maybe pursue a, a, a research project or, or an opportunity. So, I'm looking forward to a couple of things. One, um, many of you may know my undergraduate degree was in fine arts and I'm a painter and I have not done very much of that in the last um, several years. And I'm looking forward to um, picking up my uh, paintbrush again and continuing to do some of that work. Um, the photograph behind me is my daughter's farm in Petaluma. I'm very interested in, in what happens in our environment and how organic farming and farms can have an impact on, on the environment, on the climate, um, how we um, manage and take care of the land, um, the soil health as being a critical part of this. Um, so I'm there's an element there that I'm interested in. Um, my husband's very involved in K-12 education in Oakland. That's another area of interest to me that joining him in some of the work that, that um, he is doing there um, will be part of it. And of course, you know, doing whatever I can for Berkeley. Um, it's not like I'm going to go away. I'm not. <laughs> I'm just changing um, the nature of my my relationship to the campus. So, and it's been so rewarding to be a faculty member here. So rewarding to be able to have leadership roles, whether it's having been chair of the Academic Senate, um, being involved in in various positions as a vice provost or vice chancellor, and culminating this year with with this role. It's just it's been amazing. I, I couldn't be more thankful um, and more grateful um, for the chance. Yeah, I just want to say personally, it's been a thrill and an honor to work, work with and for you over the years. Um, and I know you'll be missed. I won't even start to go down that trail other than to say <laughs> that. Um, I know there'll be opportunity in this long goodbye for more of that. Um, <laughs> but Carol, let me just turn to you just for a few close, closing thoughts as we end the academic year and Kathy ends her tenure and we look forward to the year ahead. Well, I, I wanna end with, as I began with thanks, thanks to everyone who's part of the Cal community, everyone who's listening and watching today. Thank you for all of your efforts to support the campus in, in circumstances that have been trying. And I wanna give a special shout out and thanks to Kathy, who has just been a wonderful, wonderful partner in this last uh, challenging year. And, and finally, I mean, graduation is, um, I think everybody who lives in universities really loves the rhythm of the new students arriving in the fall and then graduation with its whoops and cheers and tears at the end of it. And this I understand is the biggest graduation ever. And I think we have so much to celebrate in the resilience of this community. Um, the students have done so much. If you think of these students graduating this year, um, a, a year and a half of, if they've been here four years, um, uh, have been remote. 
and then they've come back and they've reopened the campus and just the, the, the just enormous resilience, strength, creativity that's perpetually in our students, but we've seen particularly this year is something to really celebrate. So we can all say Fiat Lux and Go Bears. Yep, can end better than that. Uh, Fiat Lux and Go Bears indeed. Um, Kathy and Carol, I wanna thank both of you for your time and, and generosity with, of thought. And thank everybody for joining us for this last campus conversation. Um, we'll look forward to seeing you next fall and uh, have a good day, a good week. Take care. Yeah, bye-bye.